So I'll introduce you first, Thorsten. Let's welcome Thorsten Hoffman. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, first, uh, thanks for having me. Um, thanks to Fran, who organized this whole thing. It's a fantastic um, event. Hopefully, it'll be very successful in the future years. Um, so I brought a few clips from uh, Wall Street Journal from the um, um, editor, I guess, who covers um, Bitcoin. I brought a clip from Bloomberg Television, um, a guy I interviewed. And um, this is the world premiere of a short segment of our documentary that I'll show at the end. Um, so my background is media. I've, I've been um, um, in, in this space for a long time. And um, most importantly, I've sold, I licensed documentaries all over the world. So some of my clients are um, Netflix, NBC Universal, um, CCTV, um, Samsung, LG, Deutsche Telekom, Virgin Media, everywhere in the whole world, I sold documentaries. So um, then this Bitcoin thing came along, I'm very passionate about technology, very passionate about startups. I have a few other projects. So I'm like, oh, this is the perfect story to make a film about uh, Bitcoin, um, since I already know how to bring it out to the people. So that's how, how my, my background, how I started this. So basically, I guess my talk is, um, we're here, there's a hundred people, a couple hundred people, and, and um, someone like Jeffrey or, or Andreas, they travel around the world, they probably get to speak to 1,000 people, 10,000 people. Some of the top videos, maybe they have 100,000 views on, on YouTube, right? But how are we going to get this to 100 million people? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the scale, when, when, when will it reach mass adoption? When will we reach the, the, the mainstream? And um, like it or not, mass media and broadcast and television is still one of the better ways to do it. Um, so. That's really the idea behind um, the end of money as we know it. So the, the Twitter handle, maybe you've seen us um, around, is at the end of money. And um, we've done a successful um, Kickstarter campaign, um, but most of the f film is financed by, us, by, by me, actually. So um, the, 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 the problem really with Bitcoin is that it's super, super complex, right? So we heard all these talks today, and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm a geek myself, so I, I understand most of it. Um, some of it I don't understand. But how to make my mother or father you know, understand this, or um, you know, someone who has never really thought about technology or money, for that matter? And that's, that's really the, the, the challenge. And my, my editor, he has won 24, I think, 24 Emmys in America um, with his television documentary. So he knows how to package it into stories. So when I, when I bring my script to him, uh, we, we do chapter by chapter, and um, he's like, well, this is too academic. This reads like a book. This reads like, you know, one of those talks, basically. You know, I have interesting stories, and I, I, I you know, try to write what I think is interesting. And he basically comes back to me and says, 90% of this, just delete it. Nobody will understand it. Nobody will care. This doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. Stick to your f focus. So I kind of learned how to, how to streamline um, that message. And um, also, I think we need more drama. I mean, it, it, it sounds a bit it sounds a bit silly, right? But um, good television needs to be good entertainment. Good entertainment always has a good and a bad, right? Some friction, some drama, some some uh, battle going on, um, which I hope I, I manage in at least one of those clips. So um, let me first show you that um, this is not a video. This is an audio. I don't have the video. This is an interview with, we did with the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm just going to play about 40 seconds of it, very typically. So this is the guy who covers Bitcoin for the financial um, industry, I guess. First got into Bitcoin, started hearing about it uh, early in the spring of 2013, in the late winter, early spring. Wasn't interested, didn't think it was really, like, like I think a lot of people come to it for your first reaction is this is a scam, this can't be real, this is not. And I actually remember being asked to write about it and just saying flat out, I'm not writing, I'm not writing about this thing, it's stupid. And just kept hearing more about it, kept seeing it come up, the, the word pop up, the name pop up. Finally, kind of got to the point where I said, all right, maybe this is something I should at least write about, at least help our readers understand it. Started writing about it and it just snowballed from there. It, kind of thing where the more I looked, the more I saw there was to see, and the further down the rabbit hole I got. And then by the summer of 2013, I think I was completely hooked on it and realized that this 
All right, so basically this is the story of all of us, right? I mean, um, um, everybody first thinks it's a scam and then eventually you go down the rabbit hole. So, um, but what's interesting here, this is a guy, super sophisticated journalist, super, super sophisticated um, readership, right? All these finance people who, who read Wall Street, Wall Street Journal. And yet he had to get in touch or hear about Bitcoin 10 times, 20 times before he took it, uh, took it seriously. So how much more harder is it for the normal folks, for my mother, for, for your auntie or for your, you know, what, what, whatever. So um, I think we, we have to keep reminding us to really simplify, dumb it down, make it more entertaining um, in order to reach hundreds of millions of, of, of viewers. Um, and here's a very short clip um, about the interview I did with Bloomberg Television. So that's the Bloomberg headquarters in New York. Um, Matt Miller is a legend in, in, among many of, of you, I guess. He's, he's brought Bitcoin really to uh, millions and millions of Bloomberg um, um, viewers. And it's actually quite an interesting um, interview. You can, you can see the whole thing um, on our YouTube clip, a uh, YouTube channel. Um, but I've, I've just a very short um, segment here. He explains how media works and how those, those media knee-jerk knee reaction, I guess. A portion of what people were doing with it. And that, I mean, obviously, we're in the media. We love big sensational headlines, big sensational stories. We gravitate towards those kind of things. And you're not going to do a piece about some guy just buying his groceries with Bitcoin or me paying for my nephew's Christmas toys with Bitcoin. It's just not as exciting as someone buying, you know, a kilogram of cocaine with Bitcoin. It's a much more fun story. So I realized that what we were doing in the media, and I tried to counteract that as much as I could. Um, and I think, at least as far as the people here at Bloomberg, I really uh, changed the minds of a lot of other All right, I mean, nothing new here, right? So, and that's that's why um, uh, we read all these negative um, things uh, and hear and, and see, and, and people approach us on the road, right? All about this drug um, drug money and money laundering, blah 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 blah. Um, what's interesting here um, is how those how those memes, how those rumors, how those little bit of, bits of information actually spread. So, if you look at around the time when Mount Gox collapsed. Um, everybody was covering it, or maybe even at the time when the price shot up, everybody, the whole, even mainstream media had covered it, right? But you always, you can go back uh, to, to those um, uh, media coverages, you always had those two or three sentences that were always the same. It, it always said, oh, the controversial internet currency, blah, blah, blah created by an anonymous um, Satoshi Nakamoto. It's always the same sentence. Why? Because journalists don't have much time, they're lazy, they, they have no chance of understanding Bitcoin within a 30-minute deadline. So um, the challenge is, in a way, to get those one sentence, those two sentences spread to the whole mass media in, in the whole world, which, which I find quite, in, quite interesting. Um, and, and in my view, the way to do it is not to create a pro-Bitcoin film. And there's many out there, many very good ones. There's one in, in, out of Melbourne. I'm, I'm based in Melbourne as well. Um, it's a fantastic piece of um, um, uh, Vimeo um, um, content about the Bitcoin scene and entrepreneurs in Australia. Um, there's The Rise and Rise of Bitcoin, fantastic film, very well made. I think it was um, number one on iTunes for, for a little while. Um, the problem with all these, and I, and I love them all, and I know the, the filmmakers, the problem with the, this all is it's very one-sided, right? It's just a fanboy film. So all of us will watch it, and that's why it goes up on, on YouTube or on iTunes for a week. But it, it won't, when I talk to CCTV, um, they have 800 million TV viewers. I sell them films every other month. Um, they're not gonna pick a fanboy Bitcoin film. They, they need neutral, they, they need both sides of the story. So um, with all these disclaimers and with all this intro, um, let, me, let me show you um, the first two minutes of our film. So that's really the opening segment. Um, I don't think I've ever shown this before. No, this is the first time we ever show it. And um, just uh, a disclaimer. So there's a lot of watermarks on it. You'll see you know, from the footage databases, from different producers. It's a very grainy footage, some of it, because um, when we work in editing, we don't need the full HD, beautiful resolution yet. Um, a bit of audio problems. Um, some of the titles aren't right. But, but just to get the general idea, I hope um, you like it. And please, I'll, I'll be around for the next couple of days. Um, do tell me if you like it. But 
more importantly, do tell me what you don't like about it. Um, so I'm just going to play the first two minutes of our film. Look closely. What do we all have in common? No matter what corner of the world you live in, you need food, water, shelter, and money. Half of every transaction involves money in exchange for goods or services. Stocks, a loaf of bread, illegal drugs. You gotta pay for it. We spend much of our lives chasing money to make a living and accomplish our dreams. But it's also an instrument of destruction. Some might say evil, driving criminals to lie, steal, and even murder. Money is so integral to our society and our global economy that its true nature remains a mystery to most. This is the story of money, perhaps the end of money as we know it. No matter how fat your bank account or how thin you want, it's all cold hard cash. There are some who want to kill it. Get rid of it. Earn your dollars, your euros, your yen, and transform every penny you have into ones and zeros. Digital currency, entrusted to the web and computers spread across the planet. Magic internet money. It's called cryptocurrency. Bitcoin. What the internet did for information, Bitcoin is doing for money. Could it be the new gold? <laughs> no, you have to really stretch your uh, imagination to infer what the intrinsic value of Bitcoin is. Bitcoin could be a microeconomic miracle worker and could be a macroeconomic wrecking ball. So, so what we've done here, obviously, we had one pro-Bitcoin quote, we had one anti-Bitcoin quote, and one who's like kind of uh, both sides. So when I show this to um, ABC in, in uh, Australia or ZDF in, in Germany, I, th I think, well, production quality mostly there, probably not quite yet there. Story-wise, I think it's okay. But to keep this kind of level up for 80 minutes or 70 minutes, that's going to be uh, a major challenge, obviously. Um, now... Earlier, um, Brett told us the story about um, innovation in the automobile industry, and I thought it was quite interesting. So um, what I'm going to show you now, again, this is the first time we showed, this is um, about a three minute, three and a half minute um, chapter about innovation. So this comes somewhere in the middle of the film. So we have an intro part, we have a, the, the part where we talk about the finance industry, the banking, you know, the crisis and the problem with our current money, I guess. Um, then we have that innovation chapter, those three or four minutes, and then later only we will start with Bitcoin. So, um, it, yeah. So, have a look at this. Um, see how we try to have a narration, a, a narrative. How we try to get, go, you know, good guys, bad guys, create a bit of drama. Um, hope we manage to to get this. Um, so, three and a half minutes. Contraptions that could threaten the stagecoach and railroad industries. These 
self-propelled vehicles or road trains would certainly scare horses, injure people, and damage roads. Cars, the railroad baron said, were just too dangerous. And to protect us, they used their power to pass a law in 1865. It required every automobile in England to observe a four mile per hour speed limit and to be operated by a crew of three, a driver, an engineer, and a flagman. This heroic flagman walked in front of the car to warn fellow citizens of the coming danger. The railroad tycoons, the lawmakers, the self-appointed gatekeepers used regulation to stifle innovation. But they didn't invent the flagman. He's been around for a long time. For centuries, very few could read. Books were copied by hand. The people in control, political and religious leaders, wanted to keep it that way. And they greeted Johann Gutenberg's printing press with licensing laws, publishing bans, taxes. In some parts of the world, printing was a crime punishable by death. After all, they were just protecting us from dangerous ideas. Before the printing press, there were an estimated 30,000 books in all of Europe. Fifty years later, there were 10 million. As Gutenberg's invention flourished, the dark ages withered. Progress couldn't be stopped. But the flagman never stops trying. His masters set a loose on each of these innovations because they threatened someone's profits, someone's control. So yeah, um, that was, thanks. You, you can obviously tell it's still a bit choppy, it's still you know, not polished, there's still a few things wrong with it, but uh, we're getting there, we're definitely getting there. Um, I'm quite far with a few other chapters. It's um, very hard to talk about money creation, Federal Reserve and all that in an entertaining way, but I'm trying. Um, so. Um, bear with us. Um, I think we need a couple more months and then we might even wait a little bit until Bitcoin is a bit in the press to just kind of time it right when, the, when it's in the cultural uh, uh, yeah, meme, I guess, and then just time the, the, the film right. We start with film festivals first and then with broadcasters. So um, happy to take a few questions if we have more time. I don't, I don't know. Uh, so a balanced perspective, positive Bitcoin message. Uh, obviously, there's plenty of that around here. Uh, and a negative Bitcoin message. And I've actually been seeking a lot of uh, good arguments against Bitcoin uh, just to aid my own uh, sort of uh, analytical process to make sure I don't get too excited about it. And I find that most of the negative uh, or Bitcoin's opponents are not very well informed about it and are very dismissive of it and don't provide a very convincing argument at all. So that's a kind of dangerous position to be in where you start to say, well, there's nothing, no one's got a good argument against it. How have you found finding someone willing to go out and, and, and explain in detail and to be credible, not just by their reputation, but by the content of their argument against Bitcoin? Yeah. 
A very good question. It's actually uh, my main challenge because I have 20, 30 Bitcoin entrepreneurs on camera and they all more or less you know, spread the same gospel. Um, so I've, I've obviously tried to reach out to many of the uh, vocal Bitcoin critics. Um, most famously, Professor Bitcoin. I don't know whether you remember, he was the guy who said Bitcoin will be worth $10. He, he was also in, in the Canadian and the US Senate hearings um, and he was super excited to be on camera. Um, and then last minute he canceled through his lawyer saying that uh, blah, 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 legal concerns. So um, I think a lot of people um, are interested in get a little bit of exposure on Bloomberg or something, but then it goes away. If they're in a documentary, they're in it for five years, right? The document is made to be valid for five years. And who, who wants to be the guy who is wrong? So that's, that is a problem. So um, how I've sol solved it is I have a few... Um, let's say balanced, not critics, but balanced views. And um, so I will, in my film at the end, there will be some, some things where Bitcoin might not work as well, or why, why some of the Bitcoin entrepreneurs might be over-optimistic, you know, that they, it won't replace the US dollar anytime soon. So that's, that's one. And the other one is I use someone like um, Warren Buffett or Alan Greenspan, even though they're not well informed, <laughs> I'm sure you, you know, um, at least they have authority, so I can use them in, in the film. But yeah, you, you were spot on. Have you used uh, crowdfunding to raise money for, for your films? I mean, ha, ha, what's your business model? Did you, you, you make money by selling to the, the networks? Is that right? Is that how you fund the, yeah. the creation of these films? Um, yeah, well, funding has to come first, so I have to spend my own money first. So I'm, I'm, I'm in a lucky position to be able to pay most of the production. We did a Kickstarter, um, but to be honest, we did the Kickstarter not really to make money. So we only um, raised $10,000. We actually achieved 17000 after Kickstarter fees and PayPal fees. That's 15000 which is great, which um, afforded me maybe two more production shoots. Um, but it's mostly self-funded, and um, uh, yeah, we will make the money with selling it to the broadcasters later on. So even in the beginning, so if you're interested to screen that film in your local town on the, on the theaters, I'm not interested to get a cut out of it. I'm, I'm interested to make it a big film, and then later on in the television and VOD market and DVD market, that's what I know uh, how, how to make money from. I'm just thinking about the... Um the implications of the whole balanced perspective in the context of what we deal with with climate change information where one person who may not have expertise or education is allowed um, this huge platform and then they're evaluated on, a, on an even basis with a majority of people who are presenting perhaps an educated case. So I'm wondering how you deal with that because if Alan Greenspan is saying something and he has authority, even if he's uh, isn't you know correct in in the things that he's saying yet those words carry weight yeah very good point um, I, I guess we use those controversial uh, very positive very negative messages to set up a battle right and to to create drama and make it entertainment but the actual documentary part of it so when we, we then talk about the banking system that that has to, to just document whatever is true. And, and you know, we have everyone from top economists to everyone on camera saying how bad the financial system is and what's wrong with it. So there can't really be much argued about it. And when we talk about Bitcoin, we talk how the blockchain works and what it can do. So there's really not much um, um, argument about it. But I think at the end of the film, we just have to be realistic and say, well, Bitcoin might not you know, save the world or might not get rid of all banks or might not disrupt all governments. So I kind of, that's the balanced view at the end of, end of the show. Um, if I can paraphrase you at the beginning of your talk, you said that uh, reporters copy and paste the first paragraph of all the articles about Bitcoin. Um, do you have a proposition for what they should write instead or a, a a paragraph that they can copy and paste that would maybe be uh, better for them and us? Do I, do I say again what was? Do you have a, a paragraph that they should use instead of what they currently copy paste? Oh, well, I have many paragraphs, but the question is how to get it to that one guy at Reuters, right? And I, I guess making him watch my film, because it's such a big film he can't ignore, that would be a good start. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very tough to 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 author that one sentence that then gets read in millions of newspapers. Yeah, I don't know. All right, I think we're done. Thank you very much.